This morning I wanted to have a little bit more of an interactive sermon, so we're going to do some talking as a church. And my question to you as we open and lead in is simply this. In one word, if you were to describe a key ingredient to a healthy relationship, what would that be? What would be, uh, and, and we're looking for, you know, obviously there's not just one word for a uh, healthy relationship, but what would some of those words that would come to mind be? Dave? Trust. Trust. Very good. What else? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Lori? Love. Love. Yep. Communication. Communication. Excellent. Yes? Compatibility. Compatibility. Excellent. What else would be? Time together. Time. Very good. Barb? Respect. Respect. Excellent. Anything else? Yes, Omar? Forgiveness. Outstanding. Anything else? You know, we're, we're building a picture here, if you would, of a healthy relationship. So there's time, there's respect, there's compatibility, there's love. Uh, we have communication. We have uh, this uh, element of uh, trusting one another. And really, when you get down to it and you think about it, does that not summarize prayer and our relationship with God? The need to have trust, the need to seek forgiveness, the need to spend the time, the need to have communication, the need to have a sense of love and devotion. And that's precisely what Paul speaks to us in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 through 4. He tells us this, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned, that I make it clear in the way I ought to speak. And there's an awful lot in this passage, so we're just going to camp on these few verses here. We have a, an element of personal prayer, and then we have uh, interces uh, intercessory prayer, and then we're going to look at a couple of applications here. But he opens here, he says, be devoted to prayer. And when we think of that word devotion here, that ent entails what? Like we're saying, a commitment. It involves what? Some time, energy, effort. When you think about a person who's devoted, what do they look like? That is somebody who is consistent. A person who's devoted to coming to church. It doesn't matter whether it's raining out, whether it's 20 below, whether it's 100 degrees out. It does not matter if it's icy out. A devoted person, a committed person is what? They're going to be there. They're going to follow through and be committed to what they have designated that devotion uh, toward. It tells us in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that they, the, the early church, devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and then what? To prayer. They were committed. Now this idea here of prayer uh, and devotion also has another angle or nuance to it that we see later on in, in Colossians 4.12. And it involves pouring your strength into something. And the, the picture is really one of a, a Greco wrestler. I don't know if any of you have ever wrestled before, but, uh, and, and, and it's tough. <laughs> when I was in high school, uh, we took a, a course uh, in gym and uh, the, the, the teacher uh, in our, our gym class wanted everybody to learn how to wrestle. So for an entire month, uh, we were down in the wrestling room and uh, we had to learn these different moves and we had to learn uh, how to pin one another and, and he would match us up and we would get into this, onto this mat, into this ring and it wasn't a very long period of time. A wrestling match just goes a few minutes and you have like three periods and they run about uh, three minutes or so and sometimes they even shrink a little bit depending on uh, the type of wrestling you're doing. But you're only in this, this ring for for a short period of time, but you are expending every ounce of energy that you have to try to pin your component. And they're expending every ounce of energy they have to defend you off and to put you down as well. And there is this grappling and there is this enormous amount of effort that's being poured into this, this acute moment of trying not to get pinned and trying to take down your opponent. That's a picture of prayer. And it tells us in Colossians 4.12 that Epaphras, one of Paul's workers, was wrestling for the church at Colossus in prayer. Devoted, fixed, working hard, extenuating his strength. 
The idea of prayer here, and very often, especially in a contemporary context, we think of prayer uh, as something where, okay, I'm just going to go and you know, sprinkle a little pixie dust on my, my desires and everything's just going to come to pass. It doesn't work that way. It's not some sort of a push button thing where you get to pull the levers with God and make things happen. It's not like we come uh, to this bargaining table here where, okay, okay Lord, I'm going to give you this if you give me that and we're going to have this trade-off here. That's not how prayer works. The, the idea of prayer here, especially in the Greek, is to take your desire and to come to God and accept His desire instead. It is an exchange. My will for His will. That is prayer. It's worship. It's submission. It's asking for the Lord's will to be accomplished in my life in His timing and in His way. That is what Paul is speaking about here. He says to be watchful, to pay attention when you're doing so. Because it is easy to get sidetracked, distracted, to be alert, and also to be responsible. There's a mixture here. It's not just, okay, I'm going to surrender a bunch of things into God's hand and sit back on my laurels and do nothing. There was an old preacher down in rural Georgia years ago he was in a farming community way out in the sticks, and it was early spring. The congregation came in, and all the farmers in the congregation said, Pastor, we need you to be praying for the crop. Last year, we all lost a lot of money. Things were wiped out. The farms were teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. And all the farmers came in and said, we need to pray together as a church for the crop. And the pastor said, yes, we will pray together as a church for the crop, but you need to say amen with your hoe. <laughs> There's a human side to this as well. We need to be praying, but we also need to be responsible. And this watching, this being alert, this paying attention, is illustrated beautifully in the garden when Jesus is with his disciples. He withdraws. He brings a few of them with him. And he says, what? Watch and pray that you may not fall into what? Temptation. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he wants them to watch, to be aware, to be alert, to be responsible, to be seeking after God, to be recognizing that they have to have this relationship, this connection with him. And because of that, they have to be in constant prayer, and they all fall asleep. And they struggle. But that's what we're called to do. You see this, and I know you've seen it, if you've ever been to a playground. Go to a playground, a big playground with lots of kids running around. You'll have a couple parents there, and they're watching their kids, maybe three, four years old, and they're running around on the slides and the jungle gyms, and they're, they're swinging, and, and mom and dad, they're somewhere there, and they're watching, and they're keeping an eye. And you're hanging out there on the playground, and all of a sudden, some little kid comes up to you, and they're tugging on you. Hey, mister, could you tie my shoe? <laughs> and you're looking around, okay, buddy, and you, you lean down, and you tie this little kid's shoe, and it's like, where's mom and dad? And you're looking and you're thinking, there's got to be a parent connected with this kid. He didn't just pop out of the ground. And you're looking around and like three counties over, you know, they're on, the, on the back of a pickup truck, you see, oh, they're, they're waving to you across, you know, like, like four miles away. They're not watching. They're not paying any attention to their kid. You've seen it. That's exactly what we're not supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be watching attentively, responsively, seeking, praying, Developing that relationship. It also tells us to be thankful. Notice that of all the things Paul could have said about prayer, he wants them to be watchful, but he wants them to have an attitude of gratitude. He wants them to be constantly giving thanks because he's aware that if we begin to miss the grace of God, we could fall into some serious pitfalls. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. For the wrath of God, ooh, stop. This is bad. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that men are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not, what? Honor him as God, or give thanks. 
but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. The slope, the slippery slope, that will destroy any relationship, whether it be a personal relationship, a friendship at work, a relationship here in church, and especially our walk with God, starts with an attitude of ingratitude. I've got a couple of characters here, many of you are probably familiar with. <laughs> Statler and Waldorf from the Muppets. I love these two. When I used to watch the Muppets years ago, they were perhaps my favorites. What were they? Hecklers. Yes, they were hecklers. They sat up in the balcony and all they did was make fun of everyone on stage. They had some of the best one-liners. They would cut everybody down. It didn't matter who you were. They had something negative to say about you. And they stood up there on that stage and they just kept on cracking jokes and laughing at one another and busting each other's chops and then busting one another. And there were these professional hecklers. I think there's some people running around God's green earth who think that their gift to the church is being a professional heckler. They're straining out gnats and they're swallowing camels, as Jesus would say. And that is exactly what we're not supposed to be. Because you see, thanksgiving changes everything when it comes to prayer. If I were to ask you, again, another question, in one or two words, what do we have to be thankful for to God? Everything. Everything, okay. One word, there we go. Everything. But, but the Bible tells us to what? Count your blessings. What are some of those blessings? What would they include? Put up a hand. What, what, what are some of the things just this very day that God has blessed you with? Yes, Kathy. Jesus, Jesus Christ, yes. The spiritual blessing, the, the person of Christ coming into this world. Unpack that and we could talk for, for millennium <laughs> about that one. Just Jesus Christ. What else are we blessed with? Yes, Ken. Health. Health. Yes, you're here. <laughs> okay. You are here living, breathing in this room. Praise God for health. Jonathan. Family. family. That's right. Biological family, church family, extended family. What else do we have? The freedom to worship. And thank God for the people who laid down their lives and made sacrifices so we could be here to worship. We have this freedom. What else do we have? There's got to be more. Yes. His unchanging nature. He is consistent. He is immutable. He is there and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that when I am struggling, I have a God who cares. When I'm on the mountaintop, I have a God who still cares. When I feel like everything has fallen apart, we have a God who still cares. Fantastic. Yes, Dan. Hope. hope. Yes, we have hope. Hope to get through today. Hope for a better tomorrow. The hope of heaven. The list goes on. What else do we have? The f shelter. Physical blessings. Food, clothing, shelter. Everybody came in. You walked in here. You got here somehow. You had the means to get here. You have clothes on your back. We've got ice cream in the fridge, and all of God's people will rise up and say amen to that. All right? You know, it, there, there's, there's all the material blessings that God has showered upon us. We have relational blessings. We have financial blessings. We have been un, unbelievably blessed. And when you start to count those blessings and list them one by one, now what about the trials? Do we stop and give thanks for those? They're part of God's plan for our lives. And he uses them. These are important parts of his refinement for you and for me. So if you stop and you begin to just think, even for a few moments, about the many blessings that God has showered upon you, from his character, his conduct, his presence, the work he's doing, the people he's brought into your life, to the material things, the list just goes on and on. You've got something to be grateful for. I have something to be grateful for. And this is what Paul wants the church to be doing. Because Thanksgiving redirects our focus, redirects our attitude, redirects everything in our life so that we can actually continue to pray. Because when we don't do this, we can become numb. Think about Jacob in the Old Testament. Jacob is running away from Esau. He's, he's heading out. He's going off to be with his uncle. He stops at a place called Bethel. And he's there and he takes, he's sleeping 
And he comes to the realization, I didn't even know God was in this place. So he erects a pillar, he dumps some oil on it, and that night he has a dream of God coming down the stairway. And, and he realizes, finally, he's becoming more and more sensitive to the presence of God. That's what prayer does. We are so numb, we are so calloused, we become so enamorated with our plans and schedules and ideas and lists of things to do that we miss the will of God. We miss the opportunities, we miss the blessings, we miss the fellowship. The other day, I'm a list maker, okay? I have stickies, I put them on my steering wheel, I carry notes around, I have lists in my pocket, I lose my lists, I've got to find other lists. I have now multiple lists I write. I, I have four things to do on my list, okay? I'm going to go down to recycling, I'm going to stop in there, I'm going to uh, swing by Jimmy Quick, fill up the gas tank, I've got to stop here at the church, get a couple of things done, I'm going to go up the hill to Derby, and I'm going to uh, swing by the store and pick up a few items and then go home. Four things on my list, all right? I go down to recycling, I drop off my stuff, I go to the gas station, I fill up my tank. I'm driving up the hill and I'm on my way up to Walmart. I'm thinking, man, something's wrong. What's going on? And I get to the parking lot of Walmart and I drove right by the church. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm the pastor here, okay? And I just drove right by the place. Why? What happened? The focus was just totally, I was thinking about my stuff. I had my list. I had my things going on. And I completely missed the mark. And that's what happens when we fail to pray. We miss the mark. We become spiritually numb to the things of God. So Paul says, you need to pray. Be watchful, be thankful, wrestle with it, be persistent, be consistent about it. And then he goes on to say, I want you to pray for somebody else here too. Pray for me. And he brings us to the topic of intercessory prayer. He wants the Colossians to pray for him regularly. I want to direct your attention here. I'll have the passage up on the screen. To Ephesians. Ephesians 6 is a parallel passage. He says this, Finally be strong in the Lord, in the strength of His might, put on the full armor of God, so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the full armor of God, so that you'll be able to resist the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with pre the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the help sort of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak." Notice what he says here. I want to go back up. With what? With all prayer, all times, all perseverance, all the saints. Do you think he's trying to relay something here? To constantly be in prayer. To pray without ceasing. To be committed to this communication that we need to have with God. Not just for yourself, but for the people around you. And I find it unique that here we have the man who has penned practically half of the New Testament asking the Colossians to pray for him. Here you have a spiritual giant. Here you have somebody who has had revelations that he can't even pen. He's not even allowed to convey the things he understands about God, it tells us in 2 Corinthians. He has that type of a relationship with the Lord. And what is he saying? Pray that I may preach with clarity. That I may be aware of the opportunities that God will present. And this applies not only to him, but to us as well. Charles Spurgeon once wrote this. I'll bring up his quote. Believe me, if a church does not pray 
it is dead. Instead of putting united prayer last, put it first. Everything will hinge upon the power of prayer in the church. Such a truth. I love what William Carey, a missionary to India, once said. I will go down into the pit, but Brother Fuller and the rest of you must hold the rope. And that's prayer. We must be holding on to that rope for one another. We must be sensitive. Because when you think about it, when I begin to pray for you and you begin to pray for me, how does that impact my relationship with you? It grows. It affects us. It sensitizes us to the various needs around us. When I intercede for someone else, suddenly that level of compassion, that level of compatibility, that level of love begins to skyrocket because I am now sensitized to the problems and the issues that you are facing. One of the things that is tearing us apart, unfortunately, is the apathy that we have where we just sit back and do nothing and we don't pray and we think everybody's got it together when in reality we don't. And because that intercessory prayer is not being exercised, the ministry, and the missions, and the lives of God's people fall apart. Prayer forces us, especially intercessory prayer, to get my eyes off of me. And let's face it, we live in one of the most narcissistic cultures ever. I mean, people are just thinking about themselves. They're thinking about big eye. They're thinking about their plans. They're thinking about their pot roast. They're thinking about their different things they're going to do, where, where they're going to go, and how they're going to hang out with their friends. And they're taking selfies of themselves. And they're running around doing all this me stuff. What does prayer force me to do? Stop and look at somebody else. And be aware of their problems, their struggles, and their needs. So, application. Why don't we pray? What are some of the stumbling blocks to this simple exhortation? That's my question. What are some of the stumbling blocks? Too busy. Too busy. Too busy. Yeah. We break the habit. What else? Nancy. My own, agenda. my own agenda. That's kind of the too busy one. I heard it. A doubt. Doubt. Whoever said that? Doubt. That's right. Very good. We don't believe. We don't think it's going to work. What else? Yes, Bob. Is there some fear of where is he going to send me? Yes. <laughs> I, I may end up with Carrie in India somewhere. That's exactly right. We don't really want God's will for our lives. What else? Yes. We don't have the words. Yeah, what do I say? Yeah, I'm not sure how to, how to even pray. Anything else? Yes, Barb. Unworthy. I feel unworthy. I feel unworthy. Excellent. These are some of the stumbling blocks that get in the way. The unbelief is a biggie. And the reason why I bring that up is we just question whether or not God will even hear and respond. The other, the other big one, the time issue. Really, when you get down to it, we all have the time. It's not a matter of time. It's a matter of priority. When somebody says, oh, I don't have time to do stuff, it doesn't matter what the stuff is. It's funny how we have time to do the things we really want to do. Have you ever noticed that? We have the time. It's just how we prioritize our time. And of course, I know some of you in this room are busier than others. You could be juggling kids, you could be you know, having two jobs, you could be running and, and doing a, an awful lot. And, and I understand that. But we do have the time to stop, even for a few moments, 10, 15 minutes in between things, to quietly seek after the Lord. When you get down to it, it's an issue of priority. The unbelief issue is we question whether it'll work. Now I've got here something that I... I take in the fall, and that's vitamin C. I, 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 I do vitamin C all fall, into the winter, into the spring. I'm a huge fan of vitamin C. And I start taking it normally around the beginning of October, and I, and I finish up you know, as soon as it starts getting warmer out, which is, could be like July. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I'm a fan of vitamin C. 
and I take a lot of it. Why do I do that? It's a habit of mine. I just get up and I just pop a vitamin C, take one at the end of the day. You know, I, I just, I, I do a lot of vitamin C. Why? Because I think it works, to be very honest with you. I just believe it works. I typically go years without getting sick. I mean, many, many years. I mean, I've gone like four, five, six, seven years without any illness. And I praise God for that. And I think there's a connection between taking some vitamin C and health. We need to believe something works before we do it. And if something we honestly believe is going to work, then we will follow through. If we believe that this prayer is going to be answered, if we believe God has our best interest in mind, if we believe that even if he's going to send us places that we may not want to go, but that he loves us, and because his character doesn't change, because he cares for us, and he wants what is best for us, if we actually believe that, then we'll be willing to pray. A lot of the issues that we have surfaced here in terms of the objections come down to really priorities and a belief system. I was watching a, a wonderful uh, video of John Lennox. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's an Irish mathematician. He's also an apologist. He's a committed Christian. And he's a science guy. You know, he, he gets into the evidence and he gets into all sorts of scientific things. And somebody looked at him and said, how can you, you know, this PhD with math and, you know, with all these degrees and, you know, published all sorts of works, how, how can somebody like you who's so entrenched in science actually believe in God? I mean, there's no empirical evidence. And Lennox says, stop, stop right there. There is. And, and his, his uh, opponent looked at him and said, well, why do you say that? He says, because of prayer. He said, I've been a Christian for 60 years. And there's a cause and effect relationship between the times I pray and the impact it has on my life. I've seen so much evidence, I've got mountains of it. I can give you empirical data, if you'd like, in terms of the transformation of my own life when I've taken the time and I've committed my time to praying and seeking after God and praying according to the scriptures. He's like, I've got lots of evidence. I'm the evidence of a renewed heart and a renewed mind and renewed life. He said prayer changes everything. So really at the bottom line is this. Believers are called to pray for yourself. And you know, you're right. None of us are worthy to pray. But God still wants us to pray. None of us are worthy to come into the presence of the King of Kings. But he still says seek and knock and ask and pursue after that. I want to give you a picture, a final wrap-up here, of how prayer changes everything. The Apostle Paul asks for the Colossians, or of the Colossians, to pray for him. He wants them to intercede. He wants them to seek after God on his behalf. He's writing this letter, going back to the beginning of the sermon series, in approximately 60 A.D. He is under house arrest. He has been writing his, what we call, some of his prison epistles, the early ones, uh, Colossians being one of them. And he's asking the Colossians to pray. I believe they did. Now I want you to fast forward with me seven years. Paul is under arrest again, round two. He has been confined to a prison. This time it is not a home. It's not some nice jail cell with a cot and three square meals a day. He is in a stone cell somewhere in Rome that may have been only yay high, just enough of a crawl space. He couldn't even stand in these things. The only reason a person even lived in one of those cells was because people brought you food and water because the jailers didn't. It was dark. It was dank. It was depressing, and you could die of exposure in that cell. That's how bad they were. You didn't get an exercise plan or dental or eye vision in this prison. You were put in there to rot and die as you waited in all likelihood for your execution. Paul now is in 67 AD. He is writing perhaps his final piece he is writing a personal letter to Timothy. Timothy is ready to bail. Timothy is discouraged. Timothy needs encouragement. And Timothy receives this letter 
exhorting him and giving him that spiritual boost to get back out there on the mission field and continue on in his work. As Paul wraps up this personal letter to Timothy, listen to what he says. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus and Ephes to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left at Carpus, at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander the metal worker did me great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, listen to this, at my first defense, no one came to support me. Everyone deserted me. Think about that. He's in, in a cell. Luke is popping in from time to time to help with the needs. He's been abandoned. He's been forsaken. He knows his time is short. He even tells Timothy, this is it. This is the end game. I'm going to be executed. He knows this. He's got apostles and people that were connected with him in the ministry who have quit, who have jumped the ship, who are chasing after the world. You want to talk about a struggle. You want to talk about being in a dark place. It's right here in these scriptures. His first response after he says everyone has deserted me, he says this, May it not be held against them. Forgiveness. We saw that before in the relationship. Verse 17. But, you always know something good's coming when you have that hinge. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. The prayer of the Colossians was answered as you see this apostle struggling and wrestling and contending with his own fate. God gave him the strength to endure. You see, Paul understood something. That God gives us the grace to be saved. That God gives us the grace to be sanctified, to grow. And that God gives us the grace to be sustained. And it was his sustaining grace that becomes so evident at the end of his life as the entire world is collapsing around him. As we have this man who is broken, who has been abandoned, who is pleading with one of the few people out there that are even willing to listen to him to keep on in the ministry and just get my scrolls and my cloak in here so I don't freeze to death. We see that God answered those prayers and gave the apostle the ability to endure. That, my friends, is the power of prayer. Saving grace, sanctifying grace, sustaining grace. We find here we are called to pray for ourselves, to be watchful, to be thankful. We're to be praying for one another. We're to just simply pray without ceasing. I want to invite you to become a people of prayer. Let's stop for a moment and seek after the Lord.